Hi, welcome. Going to give this a few seconds for attendees to join. Welcome everyone to the webinar. I'm just going to stay muted for a couple more seconds since we still have attendees rolling in. All right, I'm gonna go get started in the interest of time since we only have an hour here. Um, welcome everyone, my name is Jake Raskoff. I am the Director for Securities Regulation and Climate Disclosure within the Series Accelerator for Sustainable Capital Markets. Uh, we have a great panel here today. I first wanna thank our co-sponsoring organizations. In addition to Series, we have BSR, the B Team, C2ES, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and the We Mean Business Coalition. Uh, we have all heard through our respective networks that there's a real need for more information on how the EU's Sustainability Reporting Directive, the CSRD, impacts non-EU companies. Uh, most of the focus in the United States has been on the SEC's proposed climate disclosure rule, but a lot of multinationals are now starting to grapple with the implications of the EU regulation and how it impacts them. So we have a lot of impacted companies on the line here today and we thank you for joining us. If we could go to the next slide, please. I'm just gonna pause for a few seconds here to let attendees read this disclaimer rather than going through it myself. Great, we can go to the next slide. So at the uh, at the top of the webinar here, I am just going to spend a few minutes going through the CSRD at a high level, after which we are going to turn it over to an expert panel to dive into the details. So I want to leave as much time as possible for that substance. But I will introduce our panelists and moderator now, um, starting in alphabetical order. Kwesi Afam has nearly 20 years of experience developing regulatory initiatives and frameworks. He spent the last three years at Barclays as the group's technical lead on ESG regulation, where he develops the firm's approach for external ESG-related disclosures. Christine Diamente leads BSR's business transformation team, helping companies manage sustainability throughout their business and across their supply chains. She brings over 20 years of experience leading brand, sustainability, public affairs, communications, and reputation management with multinational corporations. Nick Grabar is a senior counsel in the New York office of Cleary Gottlieb. His practice focuses on capital markets and securities regulation and on the representation of large reporting companies. He's regarded as one of the premier authorities on SEC disclosure and securities reporting matters, and he teaches international securities regulation as an adjunct faculty member at Columbia Law School. Kristen Sullivan is a partner with Deloitte, where she leads sustainability and ESG services. She has more than 27 years of experience with Deloitte, beginning her career in the firm's audit and advisory services. She brings extensive experience delivering sustainability risk management, governance, strategy alignment, measurement, reporting, and assurance services. And then this panel is going to be moderated by Jane Jagd, who is Director of Net Zero Finance at one of our co-sponsoring organizations, the We Mean Business Coalition. She has more than 30 years of experience working at large listed companies and in academia. Her experience is in financial and non-financial reporting and auditing, working to ensure better and more reliable information for investors. She's a member of a range of technical working groups, including ISSB and most relevant for our purposes today, 
the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, or EFRAG. And again, I am Jake Raskoff. I work at the Series Accelerator for Sustainable Capital Markets, where I'm Director for Securities Regulation and Disclosure. So thank you again for joining today. If we can go to the next slide, again, I'm just going to spend about 10 minutes here going over some high-level background on CSRD and how it came about. And on this slide, to introduce some commonly used acronyms, since there are many. Um, the basis for this new regulation was similar to the impetus for the SEC's proposed climate disclosure rule, which is under the predecessor regulation, the Non-Financial Reporting Directive, or NFRD, um, companies disclosed data was not comparable on sustainability matters. The NFRD did not define the key performance indicators or KPIs the company should be reporting on. So companies were really reporting all over the place. And as we know, it's very hard for investors to use non-standard data. So the CSRD is going to replace the existing NFRD, although that predecessor regulation remains in force until companies start complying with CSRD. The EU Parliament and Council adopted the CSRD late last year, and it came into force at the start of this year. So this is now effective. Uh, so the CSRD is the rule that requires companies to uh, disclose sustainability information. The actual standards, or the ESRS, are going to remedy the standardization problem with NFRD by spelling out the actual metrics that must be disclosed. These are the detailed requirements that are, going, that are going to dictate companies' actual reporting. There are 12 standards. Two of them are cross-cutting and apply across the board, and then 10 are topical. Uh, the second set of draft ESRS are currently under consultation, and the European Commission is expected to adopt the first set of ESRS in June, after which they're subject to scrutiny by the Parliament and Council. And then finally, EFRAG, the body I mentioned earlier that Jane is a member of, is the technical body that is charged with developing the ESRS, the detailed standards. We can go to the next slide. So who does uh, this regulation apply to? The, the previous regulation, the NFRD, applied to the largest so-called public interest companies. And the primary test for that was a listing on an EU regulated exchange. Um, listed companies and other public interest entities like certain financial companies are going to continue reporting, but the distinguishing feature of the CSRD is its sort of extraterritorial reach, which is why we have a lot of non-EU companies on the line today and why we decided to hold this session. Now the primary test for whether a company is in scope for the reporting regulation has three parts, which are listed at the top of the page here. Uh, you have to have an employee count over 250 people averaged over the course of a year, revenue over 40 million euros annually, and or total balance sheet assets over 20 million euros. So these are the thresholds, and there are now a few scenarios in which a non-EU company without a European listing will need to submit reports. Uh, the first of these is Say you're listed in the United States or elsewhere outside of Europe, but you're headquartered within the EU, for instance, in Ireland for tax purposes. If you are EU headquartered, your whole global group is now covered. The second scenario is you are the subsidiary of a non-EU company and you meet two of the three tests above at the top of the page, meaning you are in scope. So if you are a company and you have several European subsidiaries that are individually covered companies, you're probably considering how you're going to consolidate that reporting. Importantly, these two categories are effective in fiscal year 2025, meaning the reporting starts in 2026. They are more urgent to consider. Um, there's a clearer illustration of the phase-in timing coming on the next slide, but I'll first cover this third category, which is effective in fiscal year 2028, reporting in 29. Uh, let's say that you as a company have a handful of smaller EU subsidiaries that when consolidated are doing more than 150 million euros in revenue. As long as you have one branch or subsidiary that meets two of the three tests above, you are going to start reporting on consolidated activities for all of your EU subsidiaries together. So you can choose which EU subsidiary does the consolidated reporting. But the likelihood is that if you have both large and small subsidiaries, it's going to be very involved to try and rearrange your internal protocols in this manner. If you have activities this significant in the EU, 
you're probably going to have one global consolidation system. And it's not exactly relief to have to make an alternative consolidation tree within your global system. So the alternative to reporting for your consolidated EU subsidiaries is just to report for your entire global group. And this will in fact eventually be required for non-EU parent companies that fall into this third effective 2028 bucket on the right. Um, the disclosure requirements under the non-EU parent scoping are expected to be slightly reduced compared to those under the general scoping for which the first set of draft exposures has been issued, um, but we are not sure how scaled back they will be. So if we can move to the next slide, please. This is just kind of an illustration of the timing that I mentioned previously. Uh, the first reporting set comes uh, effective fiscal year 2024, so reporting in 25. These are EU companies that are already within the scope of the NFRD. They are the first to go under CSRD. The second group, and these were kind of the first two categories shown on the previous slide, are large EU companies that are not currently subject to the NFRD. So those maybe without an EU listing that weren't reporting previously, they're going first effective in January 2025. The third group effective the next year in 2026 are SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises that are listed in the EU, although the SMEs may choose to opt out of reporting until 2028. And then finally, effective in January 2028 and reporting in 2029, are those non-EU companies that have at least one qualifying subsidiary and are generating more than 150 million euro in annual EU revenue. So next slide, please. So I wanna discuss what the CSRD entails in practice. Um, there are a few requirements in the rule that are listed on the left here. And I do wanna focus briefly on double materiality, which is a concept that really distinguishes the EU's disclosure framework from other global standards. So companies in the EU are going to report not only on how their business is affected by sustainability issues, so an outside in approach, but also on how their activities impact society and the environment, or an inside-out approach. Most companies, I'm guessing, are much more familiar with the concept of financial materiality, which is that outside-in approach, than with impact materiality. So this is definitely going to be a learning curve. Uh, it's important to note that double materiality is not only things that are important to both your company and its stakeholders. It could be something that is super important to your stakeholders but totally unimportant for your company's financial or operational well-being. So you really need to take into account a range of stakeholder impacts when considering CSRD compliance. So the, these are the high-level requirements on the left in the CSRD rule itself. But from there, we get into the requirements of the ESRS. Again, those are the detailed requirements that are currently under development that kind of fill out the CSRD. These metrics are called key performance indicators or KPIs, and we have an illustrative list here which is not meant to be comprehensive, but just to give you an idea of what sort of information will be required. Um, some of these KPIs are mandatory and some of them are subject to a materiality assessment specific to your company. So you're going to hear from our panelists next about how companies should be preparing now, and one of the first steps will definitely be to conduct materiality assessments to determine which KPIs you'll need to track over the course of a year. And again, uh, dependent on your phase and timing for the regulation, you need to start preparing now because you'll need to track for the full year before reporting starts. There are something like 82 KPIs currently in the ESRS. That number is expected to be reduced somewhat, but it's still probably going to be in the 50 to 60 KPI range. And as you can see from the range of issues covered on the right side of the page here, it's worth underscoring that this is a sustainability disclosure regime. It's not just climate disclosure like the SEC's proposed disclosure rule. Some of these reporting requirements are definitely going to be unfamiliar. So, you know, we in the United States are haggling over scope three emissions reporting, but a lot of companies already report on scopes one, two, and three emissions. On the other hand, almost no companies report on, say, marine resources related performance or human capital management in your value chain. So you can get a sense here of the range of topics that you'll need to be considering when conducting your materiality assessments. Um, I'm going to turn it over in one second to Jane to moderate our expert panel. 
I'll note that the Q&A will be open for this session, but we may not get to all questions. We did receive a lot of great questions uh, in the registration pages, so we will follow up with helpful resources and potentially a few frequently asked questions um, after the panel concludes. Uh, thank you to those of you who submitted questions when you registered for the webinar. Again, we've incorporated a lot of those into our panel. And so without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Jane Jag to moderate our panel. Thank you so much, Jake. Um, this is a fantastic uh, opportunity also for, for all of you listening in here to, to know more about this. The first question I would like to, to, uh, to give to Nick, how does the CSRD, as you've just heard about, differ from the SEC's proposed climate disclosure rule? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jane, and thank you uh, to Sirius for setting this up. Well, um, that question could be answered at great length, and I will undertake not to do that. So I'm going to give you fewer than 10 respects in which the uh, in which the CSRD differs from the SEC proposal, and some of them uh, Jake already touched on. First, the subject matter scope is much, much broader. So people say, kind of, especially Americans say, kind of lightly, well, the SEC has now embarked on the same project as Europe and the timing is different. We were behind, now we're ahead. It's not the same project at all. Uh, the SEC rules are about climate-related disclosures. The CSRD is much broader than that, and you saw it on, on Jake's slide a moment ago. Um, so that's one. Two, covered companies, much broader in Europe. The SEC rule applies to companies with a reporting obligation under the Exchange Act. So that means you're US listed, you've made a US public offering, or you have equity that's widely traded in the US, unless you're Canadian. Uh, it's about 7,000 reporting companies. CSRD will apply to unlisted EU companies, and it will apply to non-EU parents. I know Jake said that already, but I'm just saying it again, because that's a biggie. Uh, we've calculated a total, I, I bet there are people in line with better numbers than this, of, of more than 50,000 enterprises in Europe alone, uh, compared to about uh, 11 to 12,000 subject to uh, CSRD's predecessor, the NFRD. So third difference. This is for the US lawyers out there. We are talking about a dramatically different legal culture than the one you're used to. Uh, you, a, a US lawyer cannot just go online and look up uh, European directives and understand what's going on in Europe. Uh, we, we are working now with a European legal culture that is that requires European trained lawyers uh, to think through and understand. Fourth, completely different governing concept. And Jake alluded to this. Uh, the SEC underlying concept is the impact of climate change on a reporting issuer. The CSRD concept includes the impact of the company on the climate. I think Kristen's going to talk some more about this in a minute. I personally think that double materiality is a regrettable slogan for this difference. It's not, and May Kristen's going to going to correct me on this, but I, it, for US lawyers, at least, it's a confusing expression. Keep in mind, the underlying concept is different in the US and narrower in its implications. When you get to writing rules, those two things uh, often end up at the same place, but a big philosophical difference. Five, sticking to climate. CSRD is not limited to disclosure to the same extent as the SEC's proposed rules. And we all know that disclosure obligations influence conduct and they're often intended to influence conduct. And that is not a new thing and it's not a bad thing. It's not unique to this subject, but the SEC rule is informed strictly a disclosure rule. CSRD on two key subjects is more uh, mandatory than that, specifically with respect to due diligence on your value chain. Uh, the disclosure requirements there are nearly a conduct requirement, and they will become a conduct requirement under future directives, especially the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, which is uh, coming down the pike. Uh, and with respect to disclosure of uh, climate transition plan, there is a requirement to disclose the company's Paris-aligned climate transition plan. Uh, that's a mandatory disclosure in Europe. Um, it will, it'll be really interesting to see whether European companies can say, I don't have one. U.S. companies clearly will be permitted to say, I don't have one. Um, I'm up to six. Uh, the timing of effectiveness of these reporting frameworks is going to be very different, uh, except 
Jake gave you the European timing, which looks um, leisurely compared to what the SEC proposed. The SEC proposed something that would take effect really very fast, would have had companies reporting next year on 2023. I don't think they're going to stick to that timetable for effectiveness, but maybe somebody here has better inside knowledge. Anyway, the timing will be different. Who's faster, who's slower? Jury's out on that. Seven, once the rule's effective, the timing of the reporting is going to be different. And especially big U.S. companies have to file an annual report within 60 days after the end of the fiscal year end. Uh, in Europe, that's generally uh, four months. And um, I think that timing difference, when, when it as experienced people with experience in sustainability reporting know the timing difference is going to be huge because gathering information from third parties and verifying it on a 60 day schedule for a US 10K is going to be a, a big challenge. Um, then, just last, I'll mention the risk, the legal risk environment is different. Another reason why you need European lawyers to advise you on this and can't rely on your, uh, your old friends in, uh, in the US. The, the, Enforcement is going to be entrusted to national authorities subject to oversight and to the requirement to have a re to seek remedies that are proportionate, dissuasive, and effective. So there are going to be a lot of national authorities with enforcement power in this area, um, and the nature of the risk will differ from one jurisdiction to another. The nature of private remedies against reporting companies um, is also going to be different in the US than in Europe. We US lawyers are very used to saying that private litigation risk is much greater in the US than it is in Europe. Hold that thought and don't get wedded to it because I think uh, down the road, we should expect the litigation risk environment to, uh, to become as parlous in Europe or nearly as it is in the US. I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry for the long-winded answer to your question, but that's my preliminary list of differences. And exactly, it is a preliminary list because there are many, 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 many differences. Um, thank you for, for bringing at least some highlights. Um, Kwasi, uh, you are in Barclays and Barclays is a US listed foreign private issue. So as you prepare for the CSRD compliance, right. How do you think about streamlining your reporting capabilities to prepare for an SEC disclosure rule? Yeah, well, very difficultly, I guess, is the short answer to that. The, <laughs> the good thing is that the um, CSRD will, for the best part, front load a lot of the requirements that we have. Also, the good thing is that we have the TCFD, the Task Force on Financial Disclosures, which has again front loaded a lot of the requirements that we have, at least on a global basis at the group level. But then there are distinct differences. And I think Nick articulated um, the vast majority, but not all very well earlier. So I'll, I'll just touch on a few, but the extraterritoriality impact here is that we have two different regulators regulating an, a, a cross jurisdictional organization. So, we are US listed, we are also European listed, but we are not domiciled in the US or the UK, we're domiciled in the, in, sorry, in the EU, but we're domiciled in the UK. And pre-Brexit, that wasn't so much of an issue. But post-Brexit, we have a, a legal entity based in Ireland, which is the European legal entity, that is a subsidiary of um, a group entity, which is based in the UK. So, <laughs> the extraterritorial impact is very, very broad there and that we have the SEC, we have UK, we have Europe, all regulating different entities, but also maybe more importantly, regulating the same entity differently sometimes. You might have the scenario here where the SEC are relating specifically climate um, regulation to Barclays Group, but then the Europeans are asking us to report similarly at a group level in the future as we were seeing from um, Jake's earlier um, the diagram, but we'll be having to report at the group level too. But initially, we'll be reporting for a specific US entity that's listed, climate-related disclosures, while reporting separate climate-related disclosures at the group level for TCFD, while reporting separate climate-related disclosures under the ESRS E1 for um, CSRD. As you can see, this is a myriad of differences across jurisdictions. And one of the things that we are trying to do is, is build a framework. Um, Jake mentioned earlier, it, it's in my job title, unfortunately, but 
the purpose here is to design a global framework whereby at least for the best part we can tick as many boxes as possible across as many of these topics we touched on as well the fact that csrd is much broader in scope is looking at esng whereas um, scc is really looking at a component of the e but I think regardless of what they're, they're asking for, the framework has to be consistent enough in that we need to be able to make the assessment, whether it's for biodiversity, pollution, resources, climate change. The framework needs to sit across all of the um, ESNG for the best part. SNG probably is, is a bit more challenging, at least on the environmental side. You need a framework that can cover all the things that you need to report on. Um, I think the, the other point to note here is that from the extraterritorial perspective, we touched on the materiality. A lot of the existing things that we're reporting on, not just the SEC, but even the TCFD, don't necessarily look at the quote double materiality, the wording that Nick isn't necessarily a great fan of. But a lot of this is mainly focused on the financial materiality and what it's one way. What's your what's the impact of all these changes on your financials? But there is this component of um, things like what are you doing from an impairment perspective within your financials to mitigate some of this how are you how are you recognizing these risks on a financial level as well um again these are things that maybe in this 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 discussion we don't go too deep on but these are components of the framework that need to be built because ultimately we're not just measuring scope three emissions for the sake of measuring it but the EU in particular go a lot further when they look at the different sectors and exposure to different sectors and they also want to see how you're going to mitigate some of the risks to specific sectors from climate change so yeah i think just to to wrap up the the key thing that we're doing is looking at the climate specific component and overlapping that with the climate specific component of the csrd and the sec regulation and trying to make sure that the framework that we're delivering for csrd we because we have to report um fy 23 so our first reports next year US companies are very lucky, but making sure that whatever framework we have in place can be used consistently across group legal entities, given the extraterritoriality, but also given the broadness and scope across E, across climate, across E, across S and across G. Yeah, but the good thing is actually, now that you mentioned TCFD, that both US SEC and the CSRD and actually also the ISSB refer to TCFD. So if there is one component that all of them are referring to, then it's the TCFD. So that's that's the good news of today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I could bring some good news. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kristen, um, now that we talked a bit about Dalton Red Reality, perhaps you can explain the concept a bit further and, and what does it actually require of documentation? <laughs> well, thank you, and it's great to have the, the tee up uh, to the conversation and, and great to be with you all today. And yeah, I think, you know, when you really, you know, focus in on the concept of materiality and maybe just building off of Kwesi's, uh concept in terms of, you know, anchoring on this connectivity where I think historically a lot of ESG sustainability disclosure has been, you know, largely focused on impact, right? The inside out uh, impact of the organization, of its uh, products and services it's delivering. And there's such an appetite and a need to tie uh, with with more consistency, uh, the the impacts, the way the strategy is mapped out, the risks and strategy considerations to the financial performance. And so I think this concept of double materiality, number one, like it or hate it, it's defined in the regulation, right, and in the standards. And and I think as um, as it was introduced in the in the, in the early part of the the session, there are these two dimensions. Uh, that that really are are now very central to how an organization starts to evaluate the uh, the grounding of what's relevant to the business, what's relevant to the stakeholders, and how does that guide disclosure? Importantly, so I think importantly, materiality is is a foundation to really drive consistency and 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 clarity to to drive meaningful information to meet the information needs of of the intended audience. And so, you know, just thinking about uh, building off of what in many, many cases for organizations who have been reporting on sustainability matters, uh, the concept of traditional 
global reporting initiative materiality, which has largely been um, focused on the impact side of things, and, and then weaving in more intentionally and consistently how do you more systematically evaluate, understand, integrate into more, in, uh, more traditional enterprise risk evaluation, uh, the financial impact considerations, which is different from financial statement materiality considerations, to be clear. And so just thinking about how um, how that information um, is, is increasingly introduced into this, this evaluation as required. So, you know, I think that, um, Importantly, to the point, Jane, I think that you raise is, you know, how with this new regulation, with these new standards, and with, as Quasi laid out, the differing regulatory objectives, how does a company go about uh, establishing this roadmap to really prepare themselves for the compliance requirements in different jurisdictions? And, and that's where the standards landscape comes in. And I know it's been referenced, um, the ESRS very clearly. Importantly, the, the ISSB as the new international body, as, as Jane, you mentioned, um, really the importance of materiality as defined through the standards that will really enable companies to accelerate that preparedness with, with jurisdictional requirements around the world in the most effective manner. And, and, and again, kind of thinking about um, you know, what the SEC requirements will look like, how that will begin to impact how you're preparing, but how you do that in a way that is, you know, very consistent with this broader set of expectations for uh, preparing for the, the EU requirements. Um, importantly, on, on this concept of materiality that includes both the financial and the impact as defined as double materiality, the, the, the concepts in the legislation and the standards are building off of traditional uh, standards. As I mentioned, the Global Reporting Initiative, many of you US companies who have reported under SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, which is really one of the key input foundational starting points for the International Sustainability Standards Board. Um, and I think what we see in the guidance out of the, um, you know, the ESRS, the European Sustainability Reporting Standards around uh, double materiality and how to really uh, apply the concepts and importantly document appropriately, it, it really gets into, um, you know, drawing out some of the, 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 the concepts of um, impact on the impact side of the equation. So thinking about scale. You know, so how grave or beneficial the impacts uh, of your business are for people or and or the environment, the scope, you know, how widespread are the positive or negative effects or impacts um, from a geographical perspective, uh, talent workforce perspective, um, irremediable character concept of the impact, really, you know, digging into and understanding whether and to what extent impacts can be remediated by the organization. So it gets much more specific in terms of the key considerations considerations around concluding on um, impact materiality of the various different uh, risk and opportunity areas. These concepts, as drawn out more explicitly, really are have been anchored in, in more the, the saliency concept within human rights risk assessments um, and, and typically haven't been applied across broader ESG dimensions. But I think that's really the objective to drive a bit more specificity and clarity. And then on the financial impact side, I, I mentioned the concepts of introducing those outside in risks into more of a, an enterprise risk lens in terms of understanding you know, how some of these these risks start to manifest and serve as drivers of more traditional enterprise risks or represent uh, new risks uh, in, in their own right that, that, re, that require uh, very specific actions and accountability. So considering things like you know, the size of the potential impact, uh, considering cash flow, uh, position, and, and, and various different other performance factors, and then importantly, the likelihood of the occurrence as more information, different data, um, you know, an analysis with a, a deeper level of insight around the organization's overall risk and strategy considerations. And then critically important is, is how and how what does sufficient documentation look like in terms of the way an organization performs the, this, this deeper, more, more systematic, uh, in, in many cases, more thorough analysis of double materiality. 
importantly, uh, given that that this entirety of the, the, the disclosure will be subject to independent assurance upon the implementation date as, as it's phased in. And so information, importantly, the, the disclosure disclosures will need to uh, reflect the processes that, that were used to identify the impacts, the risks, the opportunities, um, and to really evaluate and assess how, how um, they, those matters may become material. Uh, that it'll need to include the description of the methodologies and assumptions applied, um, the determination of the material information related to the impacts, risks, and opportunities, including thresholds. And that's a big uh, part of the, the, the question mark with many organizations. And I know we expect to see some additional guidance uh, coming in the not so distant future. A description of the organization and processes for decision making and the related internal controls surrounding those processes. And then <clears throat> the extent to which and how the processes to identify and assess um, and manage, uh, you know, are, are integrated into the overall risk management process of, of the organization. And then how, in, 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 in some cases, in certain instances, how and whether the processes have changed compared to the, to the prior reporting period. So again, with that emphasis on, um, you know, integrating these, these considerations more systematically into an analysis and, and the output, it's critical as organizations follow the, the guidance that, that, that we see today and that that we will anticipate um, through the lens of documentation, because this will need to be supportable and evidence to determine and support the conclusion reached that, that guides and dictates the ultimate disclosure. Thank you so much, Kristen. And may I add, one of the misunderstandings I sometimes hear when we talk about double materiality is that people think it's the intersection between the two lenses. That is not the case. So it can actually be the case that you have something that is very important from an impact perspective, but where the company really couldn't give a hood. And also on the other side, where it's really important for the company and the stakeholders, they don't care. Uh, so, so it's not the intersection, it's the entirety. So that is important to understand also. Thank you so much, uh, Nick. Now we've heard all the requirements. So how and when should, would you recommend that the impacted non-EU companies start preparing for this? You know, there's a, uh... The, we saw the compliance dates, compliance dates earlier. I, the, the, the first thing you do have to figure out uh, if you're a, a potentially impacted non-EU company, you do have to figure out, I think now, I, I don't know, Quiz, you could shake your head if you think I'm wrong. You have to figure out now whether you're in scope uh, and, or, and likely to be in scope as the requirements roll in. Um, you have to start, build, if, you have a good chance of being in scope, you have to start now building the working group that's going to address these matters, start building expertise. Um, that's because, uh, as I said before, I think you need skills you may not have in your organization to do this, and you're gonna need outside advisors you may not have, and you could make mistakes. Uh, so I think you need to build a little time uh, so that uh, you can pick advisors and then replace them if you need to, uh, try working with internal resources uh, to develop a team and then hire if you need to. Uh, I, to state the obvious, the competition for experienced people in these areas is, uh, is brutal. There's a lot more demand than supply of people who know what they're talking about, um, which is not true of everything. If you want people who know a lot about SPACs, I think they're available. But for sustainability disclosures, you're going to have a challenge. Um, you need to get, if you're a multinational group, uh, some kind of central visibility over subsidiary reporting. One of the things that is going to happen to multinational groups is you're going to have subsidiaries. Uh, this is for big-ish companies, but not, not so, you know, not that big. Uh, you're going to have multiple subsidiaries with potential independent CSRD reporting obligations. And I think you don't want them going off on their own. I think you want to be thinking about uh, stage, first of all, centralizing and getting visibility on who's got to do what, but also thinking about how you stage the transition from uh, consolidated reporting of European operations to the ultimate stage, which is reporting of global operations. And for that purpose, you don't want people uh, starting to implement a plan before there's a plan. 
be, beyond those general uh, concepts, how to prepare depends a lot on what you're already doing. Um, if you're uh, if you're Barclays and you're already doing a lot and have been for years, then you're building on an existing team and existing practices. If you're in that population that is not has not been doing sustainability reporting because you don't have to and you don't care, uh, you're going to have to change that, and you have a lot of work to do to prepare. Um, for organizations that already have a robust sustainability reporting um, practice and, and working group, uh, this is incremental. Thank you so much, Nick. And that leads exactly over to Quasi. <laughs> now that you are a subject to CSRD, what, how, how do you see this? What, what, is, uh, what will be novel for you? What will uniquely challenging for you uh, about this directive? How do you how yeah. do you see this? I mean, firstly, I think I think um, the answers that uh, Kristen and Nick gave a great lead in, and Nick covered my roadmap, my plan very well. I don't know if you've been peering over my shoulder in terms of what we're working on, but that's I think he laid the playbook out very clearly for any company. The the key things that I would just kind of enrich and really just add to what Nick is saying is that you need to start soon. As I say, for us, it's earlier than it would be for a lot of the US companies, but we are a non-EU bank with a subsidiary in the EU. But the, because of this, the, the nature of the business, we're having to do a lot of this reporting. So what does it mean for us? Well, you know, CSRD in particular is actually just an, a, a part of, it's part of the roadmap. We had uh, in 2023, sorry, 2021, we had the EU taxonomy. And last year we had for FY, FY22, we had CR2, Pillar 3, ESG. Both of them require us to report on the environmental, um, climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, exposure of our banking book and our balance sheet across different client populations, both entities in, in scope of the NFRD and those not in the case of the CR2. So that, that, that whole series of work has prepared us. But I think Nick, Nick touched on a point, which I don't know, <laughs> we've done that and that has put us ahead maybe, but actually sometimes if you have nothing, it's easier to build from. This is probably where I'd go. So, you know, we've been, we have been doing this for many years. We've built a, a structure and a framework that was built on, on reporting specific climate metrics. And now the EU wants us to report on biodiversity of our supply chain. So, uh, and sometimes I think that it would be better if I if we had nothing because it might be easier to build incrementally from there. But I'm, I'm I'm grateful for what we do have in the sense that you have the governance structures, you have the internal stakeholders who are already engaged, you have people who you have their ear, and there's a, a certain level of understanding. Um, the from from a CSRD perspective, again, I think there are a number of key challenges. I'll rattle through some of them um, because I think they, they have been touched on. But I touched on the legal entity scope. That's the materiality we've touched on. Um, uh, Kristen touched on this briefly, actually, but the assurance requirements. So CSRD brings into scope the need to have limited assurance on ESG disclosures. But this is really broad because it's not just about having, it's about any ESG disclosures in your report being assured. That, to my earlier point, there's a, there's a couple of other regu regulations that are not CSRD require us to make ESG related disclosures like EU taxonomy, which now all of a sudden become auditable as a result of the CSRD. So that in itself is a huge thing. Um, the fact that even, even when you talk about the E of the ESNG, CSRD looks at environment far beyond climate. So water, marine resources, pollution, circular economy, all of those things are going to require engagement of new frameworks and internally because this is going to be different teams of people who have never you know either nick talked about the skill set i've been trying to hire i've been struggling desperately because to get the skill set of people who understand this topic and able to support it at the right level across all, all of it is really challenging if you want to get more technical then there's things like how these disclosures are even submitted so you know this is this reporting is going to have to be submitted via the european single access point for example so making sure that the technology is in place in order to be able to comply and be able to do a lot of that and i think the for for us banks in particular perhaps the there is a regulation called the eu taxonomy which is already enforced and for this year we have to report 
on something called the green asset ratio. The challenge is that for CSRD, when it comes into force, it will replace the NFRD. EU taxonomy applies to entities in scope of the NFRD. So if the NFRD is replaced by the CSRD, which is a broader scope, as we've discussed, EU taxonomy applies to companies in scope of the CSRD, which has extraterritorial scope, which is going to bring in lots of different legal entities. So even from a, Bar from a Barclays perspective, we go from having to do the EU taxonomy for one, for one legal entity to having to do it for three legal entities, right? And so that's a massive <laughs> undertaking. If you've, if you've ever looked at the work that has to be done for taxonomy, that's a massive undertaking in itself as a standalone. And I think as well was briefly touched on, but the CS Triple D is another regulation, um, the Corporate um, Due Diligence Directive, which is going to kind of divine, define the whole materiality component for us and, and the, the scope or the extent to which value chain becomes um, applicable to our material to our business. And that in itself, again, could shift the land, this landscape in terms of what, what we have to look at as materiality, because for CSRD, even if something is not material, you have to do something which is a non-materiality assessment. You have to be able to prove that it's non-material. So it's not as easy as just saying, oh, you know, this isn't relevant or material to my business. You have to prove non-materiality. So all of these things um, make for a CSRD to become a very big and painful piece of work. But the key thing for us, uh, and I guess all of those are pretty novel for us, for challenges, but the key thing for us is a challenge that isn't particularly novel, data. So anybody who works in a bank, anybody who has spent any time in banking over the last few decades understands the challenges of data, getting the data, managing the data, maintaining the data, making sure that it's the right data and it tells you what, what it's supposed to tell you. So data is a huge challenge. We have to be able to collect this data from first jam in order to be able to report on it at the end of the year. So that means the project needs to be executed and in place by the end of this year in order to begin to collate that data from the start of next year, which is massive. Data then takes you to the secondary problem, which is operating model. So the ability to actually take the data and deliver an output. You know, those are all new concepts across the bank. And this is once you've gone beyond the requirements, the reg requirements, the technical requirements of the ESU regulation into some more familiar territory around operationalization of change within a large multinational institution like an investment bank, those challenges then begin to manifest themselves in, in whole as well around data collection, operating model changes. And yeah, I think I'll, I'll end it there before I make people too scared. <laughs> That's very fine. And it's actually water on my, my mill, I must say, because one of my key messages when I'm out speaking to companies is, please make sure that the sustainability department and the financial department, they work together because they have systems, they have people who knows how to collect data and how to get uh, be sure that you can audit it. They know about evidences. When do you have an evidence and when do you not have an evidence? They know that in their backbone. They know how to do it. So that co-work, which potentially historically have been not that mature, should be mature now. So if there is anything I would like to say also to those who have not worked with uh, ESG before, please make sure your CFO is on board because this is also important for them. So Kristen, with all the new responsibilities, uh, what does this require from the auditors? <laughs> um, <laughs> and does this uh, also the change the relationship with the insurance provider? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's absolutely critical given the way that independent assurance features through the, the various different uh, disclosure obligations, the regulations. And, and as auditors, uh, there's an equal sort of sense of urgency and mobilization in terms of um, the effort underway to establish uh, a new sustainability specific attestation standard under the new international audit assurance uh, body, standards body, the international body, uh, to really reinforce what already exists today. So, so today, as, as all many of you know, while reporting has evolved over time under a voluntary basis, um, the role of assurance, we've been delivering assurance from a, from a public accounting uh, firm perspective for over a decade um, in the US and even, even longer out of the EU based on the uh, standards of the Global Reporting Initiative and increasingly the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. 
Um, and that just really emphasizes the critical importance of standards in the evolution of disclosure to enable assurance. So there's the requirements, but absent consistency and standards that guide the materiality criteria all the way through, the, through to the disclosure requirements, um, the, the conditions to obtain assurance are, are difficult to be met without, without effective and trusted standards. And so uh, the role of assurance, again, will be so critical to helping the regulators meet their objectives from a, from a driving more timely, meaningful, comparable, complete information to the market to inform decision making. And I think it just helps to really emphasize as organizations are going through this road mapping process and really establishing that um, internal mechanism from a governance structure, uh, the systems, processes, controls, capabilities. You know, today, as we hear from clients every day, the the budgets that even exist, whether it's in the finance organization, in sustainability, and other parts of the business, are really insufficient to uh, to really establish the necessary infrastructure to be able to deliver on these reporting obligations. And so, as you build this roadmap, it's important that you're building in the the time and the necessary um, enablers and inputs to, to be in a position to report, but also building in that additional capacity to obtain independent assurance um, within an already very compressed time frame. Uh, assurance is a critical component of an effective governance structure, no different than other forms of, of disclosure. And so uh, bringing your auditor along very, you know, from the start, as you start to unpack the requirements, make some of those, those, those critical decisions around boundary setting, around materiality, just given that all of these steps along the way will ultimately be subject to the independent assurance that will be required at the end of the process. Um, so the firms, uh, uh, broadly speaking, those more traditional accounting firms um, are taking many steps working with our clients to help them through that. Through this, there are a number of other, um, you know, providers in the market who who support and perform verification services across a, a universe of information for organizations globally today. And part of the um, standards uh, priority, and, and, and I think it's a feature of, of where the CSRD legislation um, was very intentionally focused, was to um, you know, make sure that as standards become more available and, and, and systematic to be applied, um, that they be open to application by a, a broad universe of providers. And so again, just uh, really focusing on the consistency, the rigor, so that the end output uh, will be generating greater enhanced trust to, to the users of this information. Yeah, they, they, they did um, broaden it out, but I must also say, given at least some of the KPIs will have to be integrated with financial KPIs. I might recommend that it would be wise to uh, to involve also your financial auditor because uh, there, there, there will be elements uh, also from the financial side. So this co-work is needed both at the company side, but also for the auditors or the uh, assurance providers. So it, it is a it is a new area, definitely, also for, for the auditors. Christine, last but not least, last uh, but not least. <laughs> <laughs> what are the implications of uh, CSD for governance and oversight within companies, uh, especially uh, perhaps also for the board level? Yes, thank you very much, Jamie, and a warm uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and congratulations also to my fellow panelists um, who have highlighted and touched upon different elements of governance, but we know that boards and management are really in the spotlight today with rising stakeholder expectation, and that includes also the regulatory environment. We know that in Europe, we have the most far reaching requirements, whether it's the CSRD or as we've mentioned also the CSDDD, and it fundamentally changes the role of boards and it gives them highlighted accountability and a duty of care which is very different. So they have a duty to act now regarding sustainability related risks as well as opportunities. And this goes beyond climate, but also to touch social impact, human rights, as well as governance. And to be specific, there are a number of disclosures that boards now will need to be able uh, to consider and that are related to their board oversight on sustainability, the responsibilities outlined in mandates, the frequency of engagement, the board exper experience or expertise and knowledge, 
how risks and opportunities are considered in strategy, as many of my co-panelists have pointed out today, incentive remuneration considerations, as well as the role in the due diligence process and the sign-off in reporting, including materiality and performance. So the role of the board is now far reaching compared to simply oversight of the board and sign off once a year. This means a changed mindset from the board to act on climate, social impact, human rights, as well as the risks and the opportunities and make sure that they understand how this is part of the company's transformation strategy and growth over the short, medium and long term. Um, I have nine recommendations. I'm going to take Nick's number that he started off with. So I'm going to end this to say we have nine recommendations at VSR. We've been working with over 70 touch points in boards in the last year. I mean, the amount of demand to understand the revised role and the new accountabilities under the CSRD has been tremendous. Um, the first thing is around competencies and structures for boards really to build their capacity through tailored training, education to the company's specific circumstances. The second one is really incorporating sustainability competencies into the school, the board's skills matrix. The third one is understanding which board committees are charged with sustainability or ESG oversight and adapting their messaging and also embedding it across the terms of reference. Understanding material risks and salient impacts, and the board does have a role in the materiality as been highlighted. Identifying emerging risks and future risks and opportunities using scenario analysis, for example, to have a look at the long term and understanding also the implications for the business and that joint problem solving. Elevating stakeholder perspectives, uh, anticipating accountability incentives and encouraging that rigorous audit committee oversight because we've talked about assurance and verification. And then finally, it takes leadership, its tone from the top. And I think this is one point that I would really like to spend a quick moment on. It's a different type of leadership. It's a different type of dialogue between the chief sustainability officer, management and the board. They all have the re recommend, sorry, they all have the related areas of expertise, but they need greater dialogue collaboration and understanding of what their combined roles are today in this new regulatory framework. So if I would walk away and to say one of the key things that you have to concentrate, one is make sure that you're working together to upskill your board on the implications of this and the company strategy. Help the board to understand the implications. It's not a one-shot business. It's a journey. This is starting 2025, or in some cases, as Kwesi has pointed out, 2024 onwards. This is going to be lasting with us a long time. It's not going to go away. Many members have asked me this. It's not. We're just at the beginning. And make sure that you focus on the material issues for your long-term business value. Thank you so much, Christine. I think these are fantastic advices. Um... I think they could also be used even if we did not have the CSRD to push the companies, but that's another matter. Um, thank you so much. I can see on the Q&A that we have received a ton of questions. Um, and we will come back to you afterwards, as Jake also hinted at. But there is one which I would really like to touch upon just for two seconds. There is one who's asking uh, whether the CSRD also will cover nature. And yes a lot of nature will also be included. I can guarantee that part. So for that, Jake, I'll toss it back to you. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you to our panelists. We really appreciate it. I wish we had more time here. Clearly, there's a lot to cover. Um, thank you to those of you who submitted Q&A, both in the registration period and live here. We will do our best to get some FAQs around to registered attendees next week. Um, with that, I just want to cover a few promotional slides here. We have a course coming up in partnership with the Michigan Ross School of Business on building board expertise on sustainability, which is very pertinent here. We have um, our Freedom to Invest campaign, uh, which you can scan that QR to learn more. This is uh, in response to the sort of anti-ESG backlash that's ongoing in U.S. policymaking circles. And then finally, we have our lawmaker education and advocacy days coming up next week at series and an evening with series in San Francisco in October. 
So thank you so much again for joining. A recording of this will be available after the fact, and we will follow up with those frequently asked questions and some helpful resources on CSRD as you continue to assess how this affects your company. Thank you so much.